Professor Siqueira has a track record in collaborative projects, resulting in several publications in international journals and book series. His international partners include colleagues at the University of Hawaii, the Goldsmiths University of London, Universidad de Jaén, among many others. He is associate professor of, uh, sorry, he is associate editor of the journal Intercultural Education, and he supervises MA thesis and PhD dissertations in both Brazil and Spain. He has established a really nice talk series streamlined through YouTube, which focuses on English as a lingua franca and invites scholars from Brazil and several other countries to hold guest lectures. If you're interested in English as a lingua franca and the topics addressed in the guest lecture today, please contact Professor Cicada. Uh, well, as you can see, the title of his lecture is Virtual English as a Lingua Franca, Belf critical interculturality and decoloniality. How can we build such bridges in the ELT classroom? Now, please let me give the floor to our guest, Professor Sava Siqueira. Thank you, Mileni. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, I would say that uh, I, I, as Mileni mentioned, as uh, I just came back from from Berlin and Potsdam, and I, I still feel that I'm I'm here and there. So then, uh, it's great to be, you know, uh, back in a sense, uh, despite it's online, but it's it feels like uh, you know being there with you. So then, thank you very much, uh, Mileni, and also uh, the radical uh, participants and the leaders. For this kind invitation, so I uh, I would say I don't know we have people from different parts of the world, but I would say good morning from Salvador, good afternoon probably in in Germany, and many in in I don't know maybe even good evening somewhere else. But uh, you know it's it's always a pleasure. So then uh, I'm going to share my screen with you as. Uh, Professor uh, Mendes has mentioned, so uh, one of my interests, uh, I've been uh, working with English for many years and also uh, especially in applied linguistics here at uh, Bahia Federal University. And uh, of course, uh, I, I would say that one of my main areas of uh, investigation is, uh, you know, the implications uh, to teacher education, since we are very much into teaching uh, in, into uh, ELT education here in Brazil. So, of course, trying to establish connections with other fields and, uh, you know, ELF as a research, uh, let's say, field has grown a lot and has given uh, or making room for this dialogue with other, uh, let's say, fields and even field, uh, fields within the field of the elf field, and one of them is something that might seem a little bit new, which is virtual English as a lingua franca. So then I, I, I'm bringing this, let's say, this acronym, even though it's not mine, and I'm going to, to share this with you. And of course, trying to establish connections with what, I, what we mean by critical interculturality and you know, decolonial studies, which is, um, you know, is a field that has been growing a lot, especially here in Latin America. And then, of course, having the LT classroom as, let's say, our uh, main focus, right? So then here's the, the, the roadmap. So I'm going to, uh, like, have something to start the conversation. Then I'm going very briefly to define ELF for the ones who are not familiar with the concept. And then, of course, VELF, and uh, I'll be uh, referring to a book that is that was recent published, and maybe it's the first one that uses uh, this term and was published. It was edited by uh, Immaculada Pineda and uh, Rino Bosso, so it was published this year by Routledge, and uh, I have contributed with uh, two co-authors from from Brazil. Uh, basically, I'm going to uh, center, uh, when I talk about El, uh, VELF, I'm going to uh, to draw on, on, on materials from this book. 
Then I'm going to very quickly talk about perspectives of interculturality, then uh, cultural interculturality and D or coloniality. So then uh, uh, making room for wealth in ELT. Uh, so how can we build these bridges? And finally, uh, wealth and decolonial studies, a little bit about decolonial studies, and then uh, wrapping up with a very simple and quick activity or, you know, uh, uh, presenting, a, 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 let's say, a virtual resource uh, and then trying to stimulate the audience to come up with potential activities for what I call a wealth enhanced classroom. OK, so then this is our roadmap and I'm going to start the conversation uh, with an excerpt from a Facebook interaction just to show. Uh, and of course, I'm sure you know, uh, Mileni has brilliantly and with colleagues working with, uh, you know, wealth interactions uh, uh, with online games, and I'm going to refer to this. But just for us to have an idea uh, how, you know, things uh, or how uh, English has been used uh, in, in, the, in the virtual world, especially through social media. This is a, uh, this is an excerpt with a uh, a couple of responses from Facebook. Uh, and then uh, you can see here a phenomenon, uh, a phenomenon that has been happening, uh, or it ha has always been here, but then now we can see easily on, on the internet, uh, which is translanguaging. So then if you look at the first, this is a post by a, a Filipino uh, colleague and then you can see here when he refers to, you know, he uses uh, uh, Filipino and also English uh, in the same post and then the responses follow more or less the same way. So then he says, in my class today, I introduced the notion of Tagay, where Filipinos use one common glass during their Tagay drinking session, of course, and then he, he changes to Tagalog. And, and then mixes with English and also uh, a bit of Spanish, which which is part of the, you know, the legacy from the Spanish colonization in in uh, in the Philippines. And then you can see that the response, uh, for example, when somebody says, did you tell them they wipe the lid to the glass before giving it to the next person? And then he responds, no wipe involved. And then he turns to Tagalog again. And the same happens with this, the, the other person who responds. Of course, they're discussing a drinking habit in the Philippines. It's, it's interculturally oriented, but then the phenomenon of translanguaging, uh, you know, takes place very vividly in this post. So, and then uh, what happens, what I'm going to try to propose here is to how can we bring all these, uh, what we call real life, uh, let's say, uh, interactions into the LT classroom to really respond to uh, you know a more multilingual and uh, multicultural, uh, multiculturally oriented ELT classes around the world, and then very briefly I would say here that English is the lingua franca of globalization, but which English and which uses? So we have to be very aware of these right of these features. Which English and which uses? I also bring a quote by uh, Blomart when he says, the world has become a tremendously complex web of villages, towns, neighborhoods, settlements connected by material and symbolic ties in often unpredictable ways. So then what he tries to say is that the, the, the linguistic or the sociolinguistic scenario around the world, especially when it involves English as a lingua franca has changed to transmit, tremend, tremendously. And also in in, uh, in in digital communication, so we do see how uh, we can uh, you know vividly work with what we call communities of practice, right? So then uh, this scenario uh, is a very highly uh, highly complex global social linguistic scenario where we can identify trans trans con trans contextual networks, flows and movements, online trans intercultural transcultural or intercultural communication. But then it's, it's interesting to notice that despite uh, the growth in, uh, of use of the other languages in the digital world, English is still predominant. So English as a lingua franca, uh, you know, is still predominantly in these interactions. So then I would say uh, to start the conversation that what are the implications of this phenomenon? So English as a lingua franca and all the in, in within this scenario, 
uh, especially to English learning and teaching. So that's basically what I'm going to try to uh, bring to us here today. So very briefly, uh, I, I'm going to try to define uh, and I bring a few definitions of English as a lingua franca, but the, uh, basically the global spread of English has been studied and interpreted from different perspectives, generating a plethora of new acronyms. So then, but I'm going to concentrate on English as a lingua franca. There are others, English as an international language, world Englishes, etc., etc. So placed within a context of intense human mobility, which, you know, in many ways, the digital world has contributed immensely for this to happen. But of course, this human mobility, forced or voluntary, you know, it is implied uh, or it is implicit in globalization. And of course, uh, you know, the new information and communica communication technologies. So the concept became widespread in the late 1990s, uh, from, the 19, from the late 1990s on. And of course, it takes into account the new functions and interactions in contemporary uses of English as a global language. So definitions very quickly, any use of English among speakers of different first languages and in, in lingua culture backgrounds, or the discourse produced uh, in interactions involving speakers of different first languages. So we can easily say that ELF as a phenomenon has always been multilingual. And then when English is used as a lingua franca, uh, you know, which is sometimes uh, very controversial, it becomes less foreign to us non-native speakers, but also less English and closer to other languages because of the cross-linguistic and or translinguistic influences of the resources in the user's repertoire and of course their sociolinguistic context. It is important to, as this is a group that works uh, uh, deeply with interculturality, so ELF is deeply intercultural, uh, both as a means of communication, of course, as a research field. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, based on this quote by Pineda and Bosso, that ELF cannot be conceived of as having a specific local or geographical context or culture uh, in, which it, in which it is used. So in a nutshell, fluidity is what identifies ELF use for it is pervasive both in face-to-face -face and in technology-enhanced transcultural exchanges. So then, um, of course, this is interests us, us here, health communication has increasingly, increasingly and massively occurred in virtual exchanges on the internet. And of course, this was incremented during the, uh, the pandemic, so COVID-19, where uh, of course, we were all home, stranded at home and communicating uh, internationally uh, a lot through English, right? In which not only linguistic signs, but also nonverbal ones may play a significant role in meaning making process. So then it's important also to refer to what we call the multi-semiotic use of ELF. That is realized, of course, via different electronic devices and tools through which bi or multilingual users activate all the potential of their linguist or lingua cultural repertoires. So then uh, in, in this phenomenon, as, as I presented at the very beginning, it's becoming more and more common. So my research tries to, uh, you know, of course, unveil this phenomenon in the real world and uh, bring to class uh, as much as possible, right? So then the context of utterance production in online exchanges using ELF has been recently labeled virtual English as a lingua franca. So as I said, uh, virtual English as a lingua franca, uh, this is the book I, I, I referred to at the very beginning. So I think uh, in the authors also, so we, I believe it's the first book that uses the term so, and it was defined, the virtual English as a lingua franca was defined by both one of the editors, the flexible adaptation of English and other linguistic and non-verbal resources uh, to the online communicative needs of multicultural social formations. So then here within this context, English is seen as a means of transcultural digital communication 
<clears throat> especially among international users in online spaces. So then this would refer to uh, what we call online intercultural communication that is highly complex and of course enriched by the use of transmodal signs. And this, uh, you know, in terms of modality, so we are going to see that, uh, you know, we consider in virtual English as a lingua franca, uh, we go beyond the linguistic features. So, uh, and I'm going to explain this in a minute. So then, um, under in a VELF context, we uh, there is a <clears throat> there is a an emphasis on on, on analyzing transmodal, trans semiotic, and transcultural discourse practices in online spaces, providing a counterpoint to existing ELF research, which has leaned, even though not only this was more at the beginning towards unpacking formal features of health communication in face-to-face -face interactions through uh, corporal work and of course uh, in a second uh, a, a second phase of uh, health research uh, there was a concentration on pragmatic strategies and I think VELF goes beyond a little bit this considering uh, transmodality uh, transsemiosis etc so uh, in this book uh, the authors uh, point out that changes in the ELF framework towards communicative strategies and processes coincide with the so-called trans shift uh, in applied linguistics encompassing standpoints equally relevant to VELF communication. And then they refer, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna go over each one of them, uh, so then we save time, but then they refer to four uh, what four trans practices. Uh, so what he refer, what they refer to transculturality, uh, the phenomenon of translanguaging, transmodality, and also a very important one, uh, which is trend, uh, what they call in trans epistemic processes, where uh, you know interactions uh, together can build up knowledge, and they don't rely basically only on uh, specialists uh, knowledge so basically uh, the idea where people interacting together so they can build up knowledge so it is something that of course uh, more work will be done on this to investigate all these uh, processes but basically as they say uh, uh, in terms of trans practices it involves uh, transcultural strategies translingual practices or translanguaging transmodal resources and trans epistemic processes. So um, it's important also to remember that in, di in digital communication today, language is just one of the elements at play that contribute to the represent to representation and meaning making. Of course, uh, you know, conversation analysis and other uh, method, methods to uh, analyze uh, intercultural interactions so they remain important and of course they'll be you know uh, part of uh, you know this this let's say umbrella term virtual English as a lingua franca but it's also important to consider that language is just one of the elements right so then uh, the participants in VELF encounters employ translingual strategies with a number of varied uh, purposes. And uh, we have a look at the complex combination in hybridity of multimodal resources that add and adapt messages among international interactants, particularly online. Of course, this would involve several uh, semiotic uh, processes and uh, using MEMS and, and, and also uh, other, especially image or uh, symbols, et cetera, et cetera. So then uh, going back again, just to, to summarize here, VELF communication and VELF research are intrinsically embedded in these frameworks that I have mentioned, transcultural communication theory, translanguaging theory, transmodal communication theories, and of course, uh, trans epistemic explorations. So then, as said, there is an emphasis on trans practices rather than on formal features of uh, VELF or ELF communication. It doesn't mean that uh, anything is to be regarded in, 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 in ELF communication, but then uh, there is this emphasis on uh, what we call, and, and I have mentioned, trans semiotic practices. So then uh, in the book, 
So uh, it, we, we have several uh, contributors working on different areas. So, uh, uh, and then I, I listed here some of them, but I'm not going to go over all of them, but I want just for you to, in, in our contribution, and then that's where I'm going to focus a bit later, was basically uh, the last one, VELF in pre-service ELT teacher education, putting together critical interculturality and the concept of decoloniality, especially when it comes to choosing topics to be used in the classroom, so topics from the virtual world. So then, uh, but there are other things, for example, exploring a multimodal and translanguaging approach to video mediated interactions, exploring creativity in VELF in online forums, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But our focus will be this one here. Okay, having said that, about uh, VELF, uh, I'm going to very briefly uh, discuss uh, perspectives of interculturality. And then, of course, uh, you know, all dimensions of intercultural, this is a very complex term to define. And the, you know, there are several dimensions and, and then I'm going to just, uh, you know, work on some of them here. So basically, in a nutshell, uh, this author would say that uh, interculturality refers to the ability to interact effectively with people from cultures that we recognize as being different from our own. There is also this one that says that this, uh, interculturality refers to the symmetric and horizontal relationships between two or more cultures with the objective of mutually enriching one another and contributing to greater human plenitude. This is very abstract, but basically uh, it's a very good definition in my view. So there are several several uh, concepts of, as I said, of interculturality, several research trends. And of course, I have to consider here because of this project, and I really, I, I highly regard the, you know, the work by uh, Mileni, Mendes de Oliveira, uh, and also uh, Luisa Conti and, and people who are uh, working on English as a means of intercultural communication in the digital world. So then I say here that it's important to point out uh, Mendes de Oliveira's research work on elf and interculturality in online simulation games. There are also, we have also uh, Marie-Louise Pizzo working with, uh, you know, international, uh, what they call uh, international uh, temporary uh, groups of, of, of speakers interacting in English. So there are several, several works with involving interculturality within the, the umbrella term English as a lingua franca. And then I bring here a few, uh, you know, comments that uh, uh, Mileni brings in her very good text published this year in 2023. And she says, in elf conversations, common ground is often limited and a substantial part of it must be created in situ. It means in contrast to L1 speakers who often already count on a higher, a high, higher degree of linguistic common ground. So then this common ground, as we can see, especially in digital communication, uh, you know, it really needs to be negotiated, uh, especially when we have phenomenons, phenomena like uh, translanguage, et cetera, et cetera. She, uh, she cites here Zhu when she says that the intercultural context has been addressed in health studies under the notion of interculturality that problem problematizes the notion of cultural identities and emphasizes the emergent, discursive, and internature of uh, interactions. So then, it's important to remember also, as she mentions, that ad hoc social and linguistic norms are characteristics of the intercultural context of elf encounters. And this is something very important for us to consider elf interactions, right? Okay, so then uh, I, having said that, and considering the different, the different uh, lines of investigation in, in terms of the term interculturality, so then I would, uh, uh, in this presentation, I'm going to make the connection with what we call critical interculturality, uh, which is very close to uh, what we call the decolonial option. Uh, and then, as I said, something that is very uh, strong here in Latin America. So then I use this, the work by uh, Catherine Walsh, when she says that, uh, you know, we can conceive the concept of interculturality in three different ways that she uh, refers 
uh, to what she calls relational, functional, and critical. Very briefly, uh, for her, relational interculturality refers to the contact in exchange among cultures. Uh, the function, functional culturality focuses on uh, rec recognizing cultural difference and diversity, ultimately striving for the inclusion of different groups through uh, tolerance and dialogue. Intolerance is a, it's not a good word, I would say, right? Uh, and then she uh, brings the concept of critical uh, interculturality. And this is, uh, you know, a concept that we, when we work with materials and also, uh, you know, the topics and discussions uh, in our, uh, let's say, teacher, teacher, teacher education programs, we try to follow that line without disregarding the other ones, of course. But she says that critical interculturality focuses not only on difference and diversity as such, but by recognizing how that difference has been constructed within a colonial framework, right? So, for example, who is who in this story? Uh, and then she also says that it works as a decolonial, ethical, and political project aiming to challenge and transform existing structures, so problematizing institutions and social relations that maintain inequality in such a way that other ways of being, other ways of thinking, of living, learning, and knowing are acknowledged. So then, in many ways, trying to question especially the Eurocentric and also, let's say, US-centric knowledge that in many ways uh, has, uh, or, uh, has uh, been predominant all over the world. So then, uh, as I said, critical interculturality, as proposed by Walsh, is linked to what we call uh, what this author, this Indian author, Kumaravadi Velu, has uh, mentioned uh, or has uh, uh, labeled the, colon the decolonial option in ELT, where he says there is a demand for action uh, by subaltern ELT educators so that they are able to produce rather than just consume knowledge. So in this case, he proposes an epistemic break. That's why when we talk about trans epistemic uh, practices, it follows that line where, for example, uh, we can construct knowledge together, uh, teachers, students, etc. And of course, he says that uh, for us to engage in educational research that enables, uh, uh, you know, interactants and, and, and people involved to be especially teachers to become what we call critical ELT professionals or critical ELT educators. So basically, critical interculturality provides this, let's say, framework for us to uh, establish a dialogue with uh, decolonial studies. Very briefly, I don't want to take a long, you know, a lot of time here, but decolonial studies um, basically refers to a school of thought, particularly strong in Latin America that aims to delink from Eurocentric knowledge hierarchies and ways of being in the world in order to enable other forms of existence on Earth. So several authors would, uh, you know, refer to, to decolonial, I mean, in decolonial studies, uh, saying that colonialism, so of course, colonialism has been, you know, has finished, but it left uh, what uh, this author would say uh, damaging legacy, which is coloniality. So then uh, coloniality here refers to the set of attitudes, values, ways of knowing, and power structures upheld as normative by Western colonizing societies and serving to rationalize and perpetuate Western dominance. And then uh, I, I like this, this quote by uh, Walter Mignolo, who's from Argentina, when he says that coloniality is not over, it's all over. So, and uh, if we are going to define decoloniality, which is the, you know, the, the concept that tries to, you know, challenge coloniality. So decoloniality means first to delink or to detach from that, uh, from that ov overall structure of knowledge in order to engage in an epistemic reconstitution. So reconstitution of what? of ways of thinking, languages, ways of life, and being the world that the rhetoric of modernity rejected and that the logic coloniality implemented, right? 
So the concept has gained solid ground in the social sciences. And for language sciences, especially here in Latin America, there is a strong presence in applied linguistics. So within uh, decolonial studies, I draw here on, on a concept uh, you know, that was uh, <clears throat> brought by uh, Sosa Santos when he refers to there is a abyssal line between uh, what you call the, you know, the metropolitan world and the colonial world. So, and then uh, in terms of uh, decoloniality, so this first world uh, is to be challenged. So very briefly, so the metropolitan world refers, to, it's the North, uh, it's taken as developed, where the solution is, where the included, the explorers, the winners are, the colonizer, hegemonic voice, valid knowledge, modern science, philosophy, and theology are the only forms of knowledge ethnic and cultural superiority, zones of power in us. So the other side of the abyssal line, we have what we call, what he would say, the colonial world, especially the global south, uh, considered under development, where the problem is, where the excluded, the exploited, the losers are, colonized peripheral voices, kingdom of ignorance, mysticism, religiosity, indigenous and peasant wisdom, common sense. So ethnic cultural inferiority, zones of silence, and then them, right? So then uh, that's basically with, uh, you know, trying to put all these concepts together. So the challenge that I have been facing, you know, in my studies is exactly how can we bring, uh, how can we make these bridges uh, into our classrooms, uh, you know, especially when it comes to English as a lingua franca. So basically, for us, for this to happen, this author would say that, first of all, we are both products and producers of coloniality, especially in the global south. So, and then for us to, you know, start bringing in you know, and start getting, uh, let's say, aware of these things, we need, first of all, to identify coloniality and then interrogate coloniality and interrupt, and then finally interrupt coloniality. And then, um, the interesting, the interesting thing here is that a lot of these discussions, uh, of course, they uh, are in social sciences, but more and more we see here, especially here in Brazil, uh, we bring in, uh, our bringing these, discuss these discussions into uh, applied linguistics in the, especially ELT, English as a lingua franca practices, et cetera, et cetera. So then uh, that's how we should start, you know, putting things together here identifying coloniality, interrog interrogating coloniality, and interrupting coloniality. And then I bring this quote by a colleague here from uh, Sao Paulo when she says that we cannot denounce coloniality if we are unable to identify it and question it from the inside out. It means as both products and producers of coloniality, we have to have this awareness so then we can start you know, identifying, interrogating, and uh, interrupting. So. Have, very good. Now let's think of the bridges that we can, uh, you know, we can have elf, velf, uh, critical interculturality, and uh, decolonial studies. So I would say that uh, in in its expansions, velf or elf is to be taken as a prime space of decoloniality. So thinking and doing velf or elf research otherwise, so differently, engage in decolonial thinking, decolonize beliefs attitudes, concepts, pedagogical practices, curricula, methodologies, assessment systems, teacher education programs, materials, imprinting, above all, a critical situated local orientation. So, of course, this is very, uh, uh, let's say, open, and this wouldn't give, I mean, uh, I would need more time to discuss, but basically, in a nutshell, that's what we uh, would say for example, elf-informed or elf-aware uh, pedagogies challenging several ELT or EFL, English as a foreign language, premises have been introduced and grain, gained ground in different contexts around the world. One of them is uh, basically challenging native speakerism, that it's a term that has become very common um, in our discussions, and I'm going to refer to this uh, later. So VELF exchanges and processes are also to take part in the pedagogical realm. That's what I would say. 
And then, of course, we have to think of wealth enhanced classrooms that are to be seen, as Pineda would say, openness to experience. So where we can build up, uh, you know, we can bring um, identity issues, um, critical issues into the discussion. Certainly, elf based wealth based materials can be approached and explored in a plethora of ways. We see, we see them as a great resource to link the concepts like critical interculturality and decoloniality as we argue that, for example, native speakerism and uh, ELT remain nexus of coloniality today. So then by bringing these examples, by bringing to class, uh, and also for, especially for teacher education, we can, uh, you know, construct these bridges. Uh, referring to the article in this book um, that I mentioned to you on VELF, we uh, basically made uh, the, the, the two authors and myself, we departed from these two questions that I share with you here. For example, how can we use digital resources in ways that problematizes rather than embrace dominant English ideologies? And the second question is how can we include these technologies in teacher education programs and consequently in the classroom in ways that prepare current and future teachers to work with them in a critical, in critical and decolonial ways. And then I'm going to bring an example here that we use also in the book from, uh, you know, uh, a, an authentic uh, material. So the use of authentic materials from the virtual world as re, as re and also sources and explore aspects like idiomaticity, intercultural awareness, criticality, intelligibility, the disconnect from native speaker models, uh, and political ideological views towards so social action. And then very quickly, uh, this is an example that I, I, I brought that we used. For example, we have here a thread from X, the X Twitter. Uh, there is a, a political issue this that, you know, I, I'm sure you, you remember uh, all the political distress that we had here in Brazil uh, some years ago. And then there was, uh, the Twitter was full uh, of, uh, you know, uh, let's say posts related to, you know, uh, politics and everything. And then uh, I, I, we selected this post that uh, it was, uh, uh, that was here for some time. And then what happens? So the guy says, hi, I'm a Brazilian journalist who lives in the USA. And I just want to uh, the world to know that Brazil is under a dictatorship now, not by our president. So the president at that time was Bolsonaro, but by the Supreme Court. Social media is under censorship to attack the president's electoral campaign. No rule of law there. And then, of course, the thread has like hundreds of responses and then we divided into two so and and of course transformed this into a very interesting discussion so we, I, we selected uh let's say responses of support to the guy in uh, to confront and and then you wouldn't believe how the class became so interesting because they uh consequently uh, many of them would even uh, go to the real uh, thread and respond, but there was a very, this is a, a, an interesting way uh, of discussing, uh, let's say, <clears throat> elf communication, because here there is no, that no concern in terms of looking at language or language features. And I'm going just to, to, to mention one of support and one of confront. People in Brazil write in English. And then he says, the support, I totally agree. I, I'm going to read the way it is. I am writer and I live in Switzerland because in Brazil, the Supreme Court don't like the Christian people, right? They prefer to, to left. In fact, even a congressman and a journalist were arrested by blah, 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 and ask asylum in USA to escape. And then we have another one to confront. So here we can explore uh, not only language, but also, uh, you know, ideologies, uh, cultural aspects, idiomaticity, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, and also innovations that we see a lot in Elf. So the person says, hi, quite interesting and curious to read many interactions from Brazil in your tweet in the country, uh, if the country is now 
uh, a dictatorship and social media is under censorship. Or does anybody in the world know you are a right-wing extreme extremist who disseminates fake news and hate speech? So then, you know, the discussion goes on and on, and then we involve the students in, in the, you know, and then as I say, as I say here, several features can be explored here from a critical point of view, not only linguistic, right? Uh, so this is an example. Also, and I'm going very briefly as I, you know, I still have some minutes. So bilingual education, when it comes to bilingual education, because uh, it involves, for example, uh, language and content, which is becoming more and more common in Brazil and also in many countries in Europe and all over. So uh, Pineda and Bolso would say that teachers of either content or language can select excerpts, threads, images, MEMS, and I selected MEMS here because Brazil is maybe one of the richest countries in terms of MEMS in the world. Videos in social networks like Facebook, X, TikTok, WhatsApp, etc., etc., with a topical focus that is related to the course syllabus or not, or even to replace materials that they find, uh, you know, that are not relevant to their context. Discuss digital communication strategies, engage students in critical discussions, help them create their own threads in other digital content approaching, for instance, VELF trans strategies. So then uh, they also uh, can create design lessons that go beyond linguistic content, transforming them into intercultural, decolonial, critical spaces for meaningful debates about real world social problems. And then I refer to a book, and then I, I'm going to refer to the book that I, uh, you know, we have recently published, uh, uh, Kogo Crooks and myself, uh, on critical language pedagogy, that we address several of these questions. So the thing is, uh, besides working with language, so then uh, when we put together critical interculturality and decoloniality, so then uh, our in my view, our classes would become much more, let's say, real world than simply discussing the very topics that are so common in textbooks like traveling, shopping, etc, etc. All right. So I talked about memes because, as I said, Brazil is considered one of the richest, uh, let's say, countries in terms of uh, producing memes. And of course, they uh, you know, the memes are very creative and uh, in many ways, so we can see several of these occurrences, like putting English together with Portuguese, working on cultural uh, elements, etc, etc. So then I selected here uh, two Brazilian memes and then an American uh, meme with a very, let's say, uh, covering a very uh, sensitive topic that we have used, uh, uh, you know, uh, and we have suggested for for uh, classroom use. So uh, if you see this one, uh, it, it's uh, the image, the image, this image has been used for 8,000 memes. And then this one, uh, the, the, the person says, oh my God, help me please, Brazilian. And then he says, I'm praying, I'm, I'm translating, I'm praying in English, this is in Portuguese. Mileni would understand. I think uh, Luisa also. Uh, I'm I'm praying in English because the help I need is in dollar. So then, of uh, this is a more let's say a fun um, let, uh, meme, but in many ways the you know the idea is to show that uh, we can we can bring these uh you know sources from the, the the digital world to class and uh stimulate our students to produce their own memes to construct knowledge together etc right uh the other one is from a, a a website that is very popular here in brazil that's called gringo dictionary uh and i we even refer to this uh in our uh chapter in the book uh, but it, I don't know if you can see, but gringo here is spelled differently. Uh, it's gringo, like green go. So not gringo as, uh, you know, with the I, the I actually. And then as you can see here, it's a cultural 
uh, stereotypical uh, aspect of Brazil's, let's say, small towns, lives, etc., etc. So then it says Brazilian surveillance. I don't know if you can see, but then they show two cameras. One is China. The other one is the United States. And the other one is a lady sitting by her house, you know, in the afternoon where basically, uh, you know, very common in small towns, people, you know, take their, their uh, like a chair or something, then they get together to, uh, as we say, to observe what's happening around, you know, the city. So, or as we would say in, 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 in Brazil, uh, pay attention to people's lives. So then this is the Brazilian surveillance. It's the, you know, the typical, the typical stereotypical of the old lady sitting by the, you know, by, by the, 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 the house, uh, talking to people, observing people's lives. So then uh, this is something that we can uh, start up a very interesting conversation in terms of uh, cultural aspects. And finally, this is one uh, that we, you know, that I think it's very strong in one sense, uh, if people, for example, if in a book, we are discussing, let's say, topics that are, <clears throat> let's say, uh, sensitive, like immigration. And then uh, you, you, you have this, uh, uh, the picture of a Native American that says, so you are against immigration? Splendid, when do you leave? So then the person is probably, I mean, the idea is to talk, you know, to, let's say, to the, all the immigrants that came to, to America, uh, and they were the, you know, the owners of the land. So then how can you be against immigration if you are one of them, if this is a land of immigration? So then these memes can be used to complement or to supplement or even to replace materials that, you know, sometimes they are very irrelevant to the context. And of course, this could be the same thing to Brazilians when uh, the Portuguese arrived, there were only indigenous people here. And then if you are against immigration in a country where, you, you know, basically it was, uh, you know, in quotes, discovered by, by uh, you know, the port, by Europeans. So, but this is a good discussion because as we know, many books of English bring this topic, but they show just the bright side of immigration. So, and, and then I think it's a, it's a critical, uh, let's say, even though it's very ironical, but it's very, very interesting to, to stimulate a critical discussion and a decolonial discussion. All right. So I, I, uh, it's almost, uh, I have used 46 minutes here. And then I, this is basically what I would like to say. I know it's, you know, it's a lot of information in, in less than an hour, but then I'm going to wrap up uh asking the audience to look at a, a quick task and then we can give a few minutes so uh the idea here is uh how about analyzing these two memes below and coming up with ideas of activities for a wealth enhanced elt class trying to put together you know wealth um critical interculturality and uh, decolonial, uh, let's say, in, in decoloniality. But then you can see uh, they are very similar in, in, in I'm, I'm not gonna say much, but then uh, I'm, I'm gonna leave here the two memes for the audience to try to, you know, give me ideas. So then I can, uh, you know, use uh, these memes in, in, in classrooms or even in, uh, in teacher education. So, Mileni, I don't know how many minutes we can we can give to the audience. Maybe like five, ten minutes. I don't know. Uh, but basically, this is these are the two memes, and I think you know they can be very interesting to stimulate. It's about Brazil, but then it focuses on two very uh, important uh, things related to the country. So, mm -hmm. your idea, Savio, is that. Um that uh, people individually take some time to think about this and that uh, we share our ideas with you yes, after, yes. say, mm -hmm. five minutes. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. be okay? how, how activities, uh, you know, or even uh, how can we explore 
these memes in a in a in an ELT classroom. Okay. All right. So then um five minutes, everyone, for you to think. Um uh -huh. and then we 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 gather again. So yeah, you can stay there. Um but then we start discussing this uh, together with Sandra. Yes, yes, that's okay? the idea. Uh -huh, cool. uh -huh. Okay, so yeah, let's say like then exactly, so at one sharp, okay? We uh -huh. restart. Uh -huh. Cool. Yep. Thank you. So I don't know if, if it's very clear, but then basically the first one says, when you say you are Brazilian, and people already start speaking Spanish with you. And the other one, you have, uh, you know, these two characters very well, I will believe, especially the older ones. <laughs> when the, the one of the guys said, one of the guys says, I don't like soccer. And then the other one says, you're not, you aren't Brazilian. <laughs> so, but let's take a look not only at the, the verbal, the linguistic features, but especially the, you know, the coding, you know, the, the, the semiotic, uh, the transsemiotic, uh, let's say, feature. Yeah, yeah. So, first of all, I would like to thank you very much again <clears throat> for, for this invitation, Milani, in, in, in the Redico uh, group. It was a pleasure. I hope we can continue in this conversation. I hope you can continue in these interactions. And I hope, uh, you know, we can uh, continue with our uh, exchange. So people come in uh, here and then also, uh, I would love to go back to Potsdam and, uh, you know, still work, continue working with you. So, and then thank you everybody for the, the suggestions and uh, everything. It was was uh, very very interesting to you know it was great to listen to you just to wrap up uh i have already mentioned uh this book that we that is is just out it's called english for a critical mind language pedagogy for social justice so that uh i co-author with two colleagues alessia kogo from goldsmith university of london and grant cooks from the university of hawaii and this book is already out and uh, it talks a lot and uses, it's basically a hand a handbook for teachers, especially novice teachers or people who are not familiar with critical pedagogy. So then uh, in, in I, a lot of the things that I discussed here uh, will be appearing uh, in the book. So then, and also I'd like to invite everybody because next week uh, at 3 p.m. Brazilian time, so 7 p.m. German, 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 Germany time, we'll be having a live uh, uh, on this book. I can send you the link. So Delta Publish is going to put together a, a, uh, a, a live, and then I would love to have you there. But thank you very much. So also I have here, and I have sent to Mileni the, the references that I used in, in the, the presentation. And then I would say, uh, multilingually, I would say obrigado, thank you, danke, as I was saying in Hawaii also, mahalo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Savio. Very, very nice, interesting presentation and thought-provoking as well. With this slide, I just want to uh, point to the asynchronous content we have available on Glocal Campus. And I would like to invite you to take a look at that content. So it's a video by Emilian Franco. And uh, so there is also the forum, right? Um, there is also the forum uh, on Glocal uh, Campus as well. And it would be great if you could take a look and write down your impressions there. And of course, um, so the content of next week, which is super, super important. Um, well, next week we are going to have, uh, let me see, yes, we are going to have Klaus Erhard uh, on politeness in digital communication. So don't miss it. Thank you very much for being here today, everybody.